Uh, before I get started, I have to make apologies to Miss Dusty because last week I chastised you for not working in children, and I specifically mentioned Dawn and Lulu. But Miss Dusty chases kids down just as much as those two do. So I wanted to make sure y'all knew Miss Dusty was in there. Um, so after, hopefully y'all got, man, it's so hot in here, my feet are sweating. Some of y'all are wondering why I'm wearing this shirt. It's, do you know? Because my, my wife wins every argument. No, we actually have a, li- there, well, there's all kinds of reasons, but you, there's a lot of people watching today that's been here, 182 kids from the UK was here all week, slept right where you're sitting, and, and all kinds of stuff, and they brought us gifts, so I, I'm giving back, so that's why. If, um, next week could be, could be really interesting what shirt I wear. All depends on who wins. Um, I already bought it. But listen, we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll have a little fun today. Uh, might step on a few toes, I don't know. But really, the, the, and at the end, I want us to know how to win every argument. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about relationships. We're going to use a verse that, that's for husbands and wives, but that's not what we're talking about specifically. We'll spend a little bit of time husband-wife relationship, but then we're going to talk about relationships, period, okay? Because your relationships are pivotal to the message that there was a guy who died, was buried, and rose again. Your relationships that you have, whether, it's, whether it is husband and wife, whether it's your, your co-workers, whether it's your neighbors, whatever it is, those relationships, that's the only way the message gets out. So we're going to learn today how you can win every single argument. So I want you to be thinking right now, the things that you need to win, those arguments, what argument do you need to win that we can, you can take these tools and you can go out there and you can win them, okay, so that they don't have any any response and you can put people in their place really fast you know and get on with the message okay so that's that's going to be our goal is how you're going to win uh, every single argument but I want you to know that according to the Bible relationships are supposed to be enjoyable you should take a breath there Woo, good uh, but you are you're supposed to enjoy all of your relationships especially your husband and wife ones but uh, all relationships that's how God made us God made us to be magnets to one another he made us to want to be in fellowship. That's why when you, you have a family member, you have somebody that, that doesn't like to get out, they, they, they want to be alone, you see that as weird, okay? Um, they're, they're anti or not cultural because we're made to be with other people. So, and God knew that that's how the message is going to go. I mean, if there's nobody to tell the message to, the message is not going to go anywhere. So you have to be able to have relationship with people. And we talked last week about being relative to those people who are out there in the world that you come in contact with and how they're going to trust you with the message that you have. They're not going to listen if they don't trust you. So we talked that last week, how to trust. And now we're going to know how you can win those arguments with those people. But remember, those relationships that you're arguing with are there and you're supposed to enjoy them, even the ones that you argue. But God tells us in Ephesians, let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. We'll read this first uh, and we'll and we'll move on. 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Everyone say submit. Okay, I said everyone say submit. Every relationship. And that's it. That's every relationship. And then here's the rest. Might get this next tattoo, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Sure. Did y'all didn't get that one, did you? No? Man, let, man let's read that out loud, can we? Man, let's just read and, and say it loud. Why? Submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, right? Well, let, let's just go on and pray and get y'all to lunch. Let me just finish it right there, right? Right, you'd feel good about that, wouldn't you, Andre? Yeah, we done put her in her place. Things are going to be fine when we get home. Hope y'all drove separate cars. Kidding, 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 kidding. Listen, I tried to convince my wife of that. Hey, honey, I'm the head of the household. You know, I, I, I'm in the head. She's like, I'm the neck. <laughs> so let's keep reading. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. I'm making sure I'm looking on the same verse. Keep going. Um, now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Okay, and that's cool. And, and, and you and I, we have a great time with that verse and those verses and especially as men, and we're like, hoo-ha, male domination, it's awesome, uh, and, we, and we really like that. And we like to stop there, um, 
but you, you, you can't stop there. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave him up himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, just one whole bit right there. That's a lot of love for some of you guys. <laughs> right? I mean, some of us love ourselves a lot. And, and that's really cool that he uses that as the, as, as the canon. We'll use that word. Or as the measuring stick. You want to know how much you love your wife? You should love them as much as you love yourself. And that goes both ways, but uh, because we love ourselves. Don't kid yourself. You love yourself. Uh, just look at your Instagram or Facebooks, and can you say selfie? I mean, really, do I need to know how you look now when I just saw how you looked 30 minutes ago? Didn't, you didn't change a lot, okay? But really, and that, that, that's true. It's our, it's our selfish desire, and that's what's really cool is that God takes that, and he turns that, and he uses it, as a measuring stick, he didn't tell you quit being, quit loving yourself. You're never going to find that. He says, take the love you have for yourself and now use that to measure how much you love your partner. How much you love another person. Not just your spouse, but how much you love everybody else needs to be measured by the amount that you love yourself. And, and yes, and I know there, that's, there's some exceptions to that. and There are people who don't love themselves. They have low self-esteem. But in reality, we all love ourselves. We have a, we, we, we have a, a protection uh, mentality that comes over ourselves, or a survival instinct. And, and we, we will do everything it takes to keep ourselves safe, happy, secure. That's the love that he's talking about. Him. That's the measure that he's saying he has. Because some of you love yourself so much that nobody else even likes you. That's a lot of love. But he said... Take that and use it. We need to live selfless. That's better. Keep going. What God's saying is love your wives, love your husband as you love your own self. That's pretty good. Do unto others, same thing. We use it as our measure. All right, where was I? Verse 29. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of the body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. One flesh. You understand what one flesh is? Uh, now, Nate, where'd he go? We can do this now. That'll work. One, one, we're going to call Nate the one flesh example. What does one flesh look like in relationships? Well, we can only understand it through music. You, you understand what God's talking about, one flesh, when you talk about harmony, harmony. So let's hear a C. That's a C? There you go. It sounded like a lot more than C. There's a C. Okay, so that's you. You're cool. C, you're cool. Get it? Now what harmonizes with C? I'm not even going to pretend to know. Now give us something that harmonizes with it. Give us another one. Now play them all together. Whee. That's what it's supposed to sound like. Okay, that, okay, now hold on, hold on. Do you mean let him do it? See if you can give us a couple of lines about Staples Allen's hair that goes with that note. <laughs> Staples Allen has terrible dreads. And they smell really bad. Not bad. Just like that. I mean, just like that. Harmony. Sounds good, right? Sounds good? I mean, okay, I don't care about his content of the words, but sounds good. It's pleasing to the ear. That's relationship. That's what, that's what it's supposed to, <laughs> look at him. I'm just, hey, I'm just glad you were somewhere listening. I don't really care. Um. That's what your relationship should look like to others. That's what your relationship should sound like to others. Think about it. What are your relationships? How do they speak to others? Do they sound like that or do they sound like this? Yeah. Can you do a bum bum? Yeah, there you go. 
Now that's kind of that's kind of pleasing yet bad. Yeah. But no, is it is it is it harmony or is it discord? That's what that's called music, discord. Do people look at your relationships and they're like, ugh, I don't even want to be around it. Is it strife? Is it jealousy? Is it all those things that we talked about last week that you're supposed to have? Is it all those things that just makes it look fleshy? Yeah, I'm done with you. <laughs> Thank you. He probably could have taught me to do that, but he, he wouldn't have been as pretty. But that, that's how it looks when, when we submit to God, both husband and wife submitting to God, and then there's, then there's, then there's, there's, there's a wife's submission to husband, and, and it looks harmonious. God gets glory. I mean, you see it, and you're like, that's right. That's cool. What we're not talking about is male domination. We're not talking about, we're talking about leading, not lording. You ever, you ever seen a, you ever seen a, a relationship, and, it, and it's, it's supposedly Christian, but the woman is so, so timid, they won't make a decision at all. Oh, I'll have to ask. I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to check out. Yeah, I don't make, mm-mm, not me, I'm not, I, if we can spend it, I don't know. You know, he don't let me, not, I, he makes all those decisions. You know. That's not, because when you hear that, you're like, that doesn't even sound right. I mean, you're not big, you're not big girl enough to make a decision? You're not, you, can't, you can't decide that? Or, or there's, the wife has to go and ask for permission. Maybe she stays at home, and, and, and daddy goes to work, and, and he brings home all the money, so she won't spend all the money because it's his money, you know. And She wants to go shopping, and she's like, I need some new shoes. Can I have some money to have some shoes? What happened to what's mine's my, yours, and what's yours is mine too, you know, or whatever that's supposed to be. Whatever happened to it being harmonious? Whatever happened? I, I trust my wife. She can look at the bank account and decide if there's $50 in it if she needs to spend 49 on shoes. Really. If it takes me to go, well, that wouldn't be very wise. I mean, if that's me, I married down. And I'm treating her like I'm married down. But I know I married up. <laughs> this is Sean getting brownie points here in the beginning. Okay, so bleh, you'll just have to go to that. But anyway, that's what that looks like. That's what our relationship is supposed to look like. Whether it's husband and wife or whether it's the rest of your relationships, people are supposed to see you when you interact with others harmoniously. How you deal with other people is a witness to others and it's a witness to the person you're dealing with. How you treat them should be harmonious. It shouldn't sound like the horror flick. It shouldn't sound like discord. It should sound like a pleasing note. It should just be right. I mean, even society knows you get this guy who just kind of runs their house. You know, you get this woman who's constantly just like scared to make a decision or scared to say anything to him or, or scared to do anything without checking with him. I've got to check with him. You, know, you, you, you get really, it just makes crawl all over you. And society knows that. And they're like, that's not right. That doesn't feel right. It's also not what God says. I mean, submission is harmonious. Because for one to submit to another, the other had to be submitting to God. And then the one who was doing the submitting was already submitting to God. And God gets all the glory. And then it feels right. Society might not like it, but they know it was right. Because they see two people who love one another all the way as much, if not more, than they love themselves. And it's right. And it works. And then you go to work and you look at your coworker and you think the same thing. As you start to deal with people. If you start to tell them something, especially if you're in charge, if you're in charge, wow, if you don't, if you don't talk to people when others are watching or when just because of that person, either way, if it's not harmonious, if it's not something that just feels right, I mean, I'm not saying never talk, I'm not saying never disagree, I'm saying do it in a manner that sounds right, that just feels, and God gets glory. All right, let's go on, we'll get out of that part and go next. Um, where was I at? Wow. Oh, that's it. All right, good. Um, I just got a good joke. You want a joke? It's about arguing. Okay, I'm going to give you this one because we got to learn how to argue with people. You ready? You, gonna, you ready to take notes? Right, here's your joke, though, so you can get ready. After years of nagging, there was a wife who finally decided, and the man was nagging, not the wife. The wife decided to go hunting with her husband. 
that's a good woman. Okay? She decides to go on hunting. So it's, it's, it's hunting morning. They take off. He drops her off at the edge of the woods. says, I'm going to go park the car. You don't have to walk as far. I'm going to park the car, and I'll be right back. Don't do anything weird till I get back, and we'll, and we'll go into the woods together. Okay, fine. He's halfway back to where he dropped her off, and he hears the gunshot. And he's thinking, oh, no. So he hurries up a little bit. And as he starts to get closer, he hears his wife in a massively loud argument with another person. That's my deer. That's my deer. And the other man's like, ma'am, that's not your deer. It's not your deer. It's my deer. I shot it. It's mine. Ma'am, it's not your deer. It's stay away from it. It's not your deer. It's my deer. Well, by the time the man gets there, he notices, and the other person that the wife is arguing with says, fine, lady, it's your deer. Let me get the saddle off of it. How you win every argument. I'm going to tell you. Write this down. How you win every single argument is do not argue. That's how you win. Every single, yeah, are the women the only ones clapping? You're proud now. Finally. Finally. He's going to listen. No, that's it. I mean, and that, that's pretty simple, but there's some tools how you got to do that part, but you just don't argue is the best way to, to win every single argument. Now, lawyers, if there's a lawyer in the room, you, you can check out. I know. You can come back in just a minute. But Listen, James, look at what James says. For, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, 2. He's half-brother Jesus, tells us where arguing even comes from. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from circle this, highlight this, make a note of this? Your desires that battle within you. Your desires. That's where every argument comes from. How many of y'all thought that arguments come from the fact that somebody else did something stupid? Isn't that where every argument comes from? Somebody else was stupid and you started arguing about it? No. The Bible says that every single argument happens because of your desires. What you think, what you want, what, what, what you think should happen, what you think should have been said, your desires are where every single argument comes from. So, what's the one thing that needs to be taken out of the equation if you don't want to argue? You. That's right. Y'all are good. Awesome. It's not their problem. It's on you. If there's an argument ensuing and you're in the middle of it, you are the problem. It's your desires that are fueling the argument. That's all you get to do. There's nothing else for you to argue about, <laughs> especially right now. Just stomp your feet and walk off. 2 Timothy 2, 23. There's more. Don't have anything. Listen, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. Arguments only escalate. My wife has a great saying. Why do you argue with people? Are you expecting them to, in the middle of the argument, stop and go, you're right. I changed my mind. I mean, really. You argue with somebody, I don't care if it's political, social, mon I don't, no matter what it is, your way versus their way, you're arguing. And in the back of your mind, you're really expecting them to stop everything and go, I was a fool. I cannot believe I didn't see the error of my ways until you brought them out. I mean, you, and if that's not what you're after, if that's not what you're after, why are you arguing in the first place? Because it's your desires that's fueling it. You want people on your side. You want people to just get on board with what you're thinking. So that's why you argue with them. And, and Timothy says, don't even have anything to do with it. Nothing. Have nothing to do, be a better way to say that, with foolish and stupid arguments. Because you know they produce quarrels. It gets worse. It's only going to get worse. They're going to walk away from an argument and talk about you like a dog. And you're going to do the same thing. I can't believe so and so. That. So uh, stop right there and just ask, why or what has happened to the message of the guy who died, was buried and rose again so that you could find forgiveness and joy in this life? What happened to that message in the middle of that argument? was ignored, was lost, not existent. Nobody heard it. Hmm. 
don't have anything to this. Some of y'all like to, how many of y'all like to pick fights? No, no, don't say that. Don't say that. How many of y'all know somebody who likes to pick fights? If your hand's not up, you're the one they're thinking of. You do. A lot of you carry around gasoline to throw on the fires that you find. You know, you're just looking for somebody to, to bring it out. And I told Sunday school this morning, I am, can be the world's worst at that. If I'm reading through Facebook and I, and I see somebody pushing a hot button issue, I can't help but comment. Because they're stupid, right? And, and they need the wisdom of the guy in Fort Myers Beach to set them straight in the error of their ways, right? So I launch into them and I'm like, you stupid idiot, why are you, I can't believe you're going to church and I was just, I, I, so that I have to work on that too. Why, why, why would I, why do I even want to be there? Why do I even want to say a word? My desire. It's my desire. I have the choice. My selfishness fuels my need to argue. And so does yours. Just want to make sure you knew that I was in the same boat. So what are you doing? James 3.18. Instead of arguing and producing quarrels, sow seeds. Now this is going to sound churchy, but it's in the Bible, so you've got to deal with it. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So you ever heard the, the old wives tale was you, you reap what you sow, right? You do. So if you're out picking fights, always arguing about something, being opinionated, everybody knows you for the person who likes this or believes this and that's your deal, what you have sown is that and that's what you will reap. You'll reap argument. Because whoever you argue with has a friend and they'll talk about you. Well, I ran out of stuff to argue with her about. Maybe you can do it. And they'll send people your way to argue. Or the next time you're together, they'll go, Oh, won't you tell them what you told me? Uh -huh, tell them, tell them, tell them. Let's hear what they have to say. Tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them. Here. It's what happens. It's what happens. The Bible says because you sowed it. That's how you are. That's what's coming back. The world calls it karma. The Bible calls it you're stupid. <laughs> If you want to have a harvest of righteousness, then sow peace. And how do you sow peace? Shut your pie hole. Don't argue. And you've sown peace. But they're wrong, but they're stupid. We know. We know. My greatest, say, I love this saying, I don't know if it fits with you or not, but better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. I read that a long, long time ago, and it has stuck and stuck and stuck with me. I'd rather people just think I'm foolish, because if I open my mouth, they're going to know it for sure. Now, I'm not sure that works in marriage, but I did hear one preacher say he got, or not preacher, uh, a guy at this preacher's church said, we got married at the Justice of the Peace, and since then, I ain't had either one. <laughs> he hasn't learned to... Neither have I. I'm going to need lunch. All right, so here we go. How you do it? How you do it? Right before you argue, here's your tools. Here's your tools. Some of them are going to sound a little, mm, sure, you can't do that. But I think you can. Instead of arguing, instead of, instead of letting people get your message and not God's message, instead of, do this. Take every situation you're in the middle of and submit it to God. Just, just take every situation and say, you know what? I'm just going to let God deal with this one. And what we learned in Sunday school and what we learned in Acts from Gamaliel, when you do that, the situation is either of God and there's nothing you can do about it anyway, or it's of man and it will die. It will go away. It means nothing to you. But what about this and what about... It's either of God and there's nothing you can do about it or it's of man and it's going to die anyway. So what do I do? You stick to the message. Now I'm not saying you be quiet. I'm not saying you never disagree. I'm saying that the message has to be central to your disagreement. I'm saying that if you pick up a cause... It better be inhibiting the message getting out. 
And if you pick up a cause, people better know you as the message behind that cause, not just as the cause. Because when you're out and you're arguing your cause, you're only known as the person who's against that cause. We're not against anything. We are for the message. Why do I have to be known as the person who doesn't like X, Y, or Z? Why do I have to be known as the person who doesn't believe in X, Y, or Z? I want to be known as the guy who believes that there was a guy who died, was buried, and rose again. And every single thing that comes out of my life is because of that. That's what I want to be known by. If I'm only known as those other things, I'm only going to reach half the people. I'm only going to reach the people who agree with me. And a lot of times that's only Christians. And we know how boring that is. Sometimes. See, God knows the situation that you're in. And when there's two people arguing about a situation, he knows you're both wrong. There isn't a right or wrong. Only there's a God. So if you step back and submit the situation to him, he'll handle it. He really will. And that, it, it almost sounds complacent, it almost, but it's not. You really are continuing marching forward. You're just marching in the right army. For the right cause instead of the other if you find me holding a picket sign shoot me seriously because I have destroyed the message for one side or the other I have taken the message out of the hands of the people I have taken the message out of the equation and I've started a cause I don't want to be a cause you do not need to belong to a cause you need to belong to a message, and that message needs to push and push and push more. It will teach you to be dependent on God. Because you see, God's, God's with you in every single situation. We understand that, right? We, do, we, do you understand that even when you're a screw-up and you go off the path a little bit, that he's still there? Do you understand that God doesn't leave you alone? Once you, once you accept him and you're a mess-up and you're over here doing your own thing, God's not way over there. It was taught that way, but it's wrong. God's not on this path, and you get to walk way away from God. You know, we talk about walk away from God. You cannot walk away from God once he has you in the palm of his hand. It's impossible. You can act like a fool all you want. Act like a fool. God's just going to hold a fool. So God is always, in every situation, you make a bad choice, and you're there. God didn't leave you. God's not going to not bless you. Or God's not going to, whatever. Because of where you are, you don't have to get back to God. That mentality keeps us arguing and fighting in a particular situation. When we understand that God is with us, we can stop and we can go, okay, I made a horrible decision to be here, but I'm going to give this to God. Some of you find yourselves with your back against the wall, maybe in a dark place right now in an alley. And you think, man, I, I really, I ran away from God and this is where I ended up. Well, maybe, just maybe, you're in that dark alley and you get to be the light for somebody else. You get to remember that you're there with God. So submitting your situation isn't as churchy or up in the sky as it may sound. To be able to just stop and say, God, I believe you're in charge of this situation as well. And right before you let your thumbs do the walking, you just stop and you go, you know what, I'm going to let God handle this situation. And maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say what I was going to say. You can still say, but let God tell you what to say. Here's one little trick you can try. And this is for your interpersonal people. Right before you give somebody a piece of your mind, give them the message. Give them the message. Hey, Listen, I believe in Jesus. He directs my path, and I try to let him give all my words. Just say just a simple phrase like that of some sort. And then try to give them a piece of your mind. If you can do it, you're going to hell. <laughs> Not really. Maybe. I don't know. Try that. That's submitting to God. 
That, that's, that's, that's allowing him to kind of take control of the situation. I, I asked our Sunday school class this question too. Have you ever thought about the people who you've come in contact with over the week or two ago, maybe even this week, they're now sitting somewhere. You didn't know they were Christians, but they are. And they're now sitting somewhere in a group of people. And they go, are there any prayer requests? And that person raises their hand and goes, yeah, you know, I met this guy or this girl in the grocery store. Man, they must be really lonely. I mean, they were just, they were horribly rude. I mean, they were, they were off the chain. I mean, they gave this cashier up and down the road for shortchanging them a dollar. Or maybe it was a little greater, but think about the people that you impact with your words and your actions that may be Christians, and they're not praying for you to find God. That's kind of sobering if you think about it. You ever got one of those pesky telemarketer calls? Think about it. Think about it. Because you don't know if they're a Christian or not because you didn't take the time. And I'm not saying you should take the time every single time. I'm saying they should hang up the phone and not think, Dear God, never let me call one of them again. They should never hang up the phone and be praying for you that somebody comes into your path and teaches you the love of God because of the way you treated them. They should hang up the phone and go, That was the greatest rejection I've ever had. No one's ever told me no that well before. I'm not saying buy everything. I'm not, I'm not even saying have a big conversation. I'm just saying treat them. Submit every situation to God. And before you run your mouth, allow God to jump into the middle of your life and take over. And then speak. Then react. See, some of you think these situations that you're in are destroying you. You know, you're, maybe you're feeling squeezed. Well, guess how they make anointing oil? They squeeze olives. And what comes out is something that people get blessed by all the time. So sometimes whenever this situation that you want to fight back and push back in, maybe it's just a squeeze. And what needs to come out is something that you can anoint others with. Something that you can, that you can give others with. A bit of the message about. So submit those situations. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 would be your verse for that. Because I can do all things. Right? Y'all knew what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 was. I thought everybody knew that one. That's on every bumper sticker in America. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, there it is. Trust in the Lord. <laughs> Y'all should know that other one, too. It's really good. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths. There you go. Some of y'all re record in King James and that messes me up. Yeah, that, that fits. They both fit, but that fits. In every single way, acknowledge Him. He'll take care of the situation. He, I promise He will. I promise He's got it. I know there are situations out there in America that you think you are God's gift to. I know, I know, I, I know. There's some of them, y'all think you have the answer, and if you don't tell them, or if I don't tell them, that it's just going to go all to hell. I know you think that. It's not that way. God has it under control. He simply needs you to tell others that there was his son a long time ago that died, was buried, rose again. And he, have given, he has given you this amazing freedom of eternal life that you live every single day. That's all he needs you to do. All right, so there, you're going to submit the situation. Cool. Now you're going to submit your pride. Okay, you're going to really have to back this one off because you all have pride and it swings from one side to the other. You have too much pride, okay, and that makes you proud, but then there are people who are proud that they're really humble, right? Low self-esteem. I am nothing. Some of you think you are junk. Some of you think you are the junk, okay? So, so it goes both ways. You all have to deal with it in some way, in some manner. So you're going to have to come to 
God, okay, and that, have you come to God, you submit it. You say, God, I don't, I don't want to be that way. Both those issues are pride. Uh, Proverbs 11, 2. I'll try to read my notes now instead of doing it from memory. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. So you never ever have to tell people you're, I get from this is that you don't have to tell people you're humble. Just be wise. Your wisdom will prove that you're humble. Proverbs 13, 10. Pride only, where there's strife, there's pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. We said that in Sunday school too. When those people are out there and they're praying that God puts somebody in their path they can witness to, and then you're a moron and you become the guy that God put in their path to witness to, take the advice. Take the advice. Don't be the guy who is, listen, I'm a Christian, been a Christian a long time, you can't tell me nothing. Don't be that guy. God, they'll be praying for you in churches all over America. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. A fall. If you're prideful, you will fall. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. It's a promise. Pride comes before the fall. So right before you fall, you can imagine you were prideful. Last one, Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride... Bring a brand, pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. So pride's all over the Bible. You want to just do a Google search or a version search on pride, you get tons of verses. A lot of them in Proverbs, but a lot not. Our pride is hard to get over, especially right before we do an argument. That's pride welling up in you. Right before you go, I'm going to, I got I to gotta tell them, I got to tell them, I got to get in. I, they got to know. They, they. That was pride. That was pride. Somebody does something, especially if they're a Christian and you're a Christian, pride makes you go show them how bad of a Christian they are with their actions. Works on the other side too. You find a sinner out there who's doing something stupid, pride makes you go tell them how bad their actions are. They don't even know the message, but you're going to tell them about their actions. Their actions are fine. They're lost. They're operating just like they're supposed to operate. You're the one that's having a problem operating like you're supposed to operate. Pride. That's all pride. All right, so we submit our situation. Submit your pride. I know it's easier said than done. I know, I know. Let's get the last one. No, not the last one. Submit your emotions to God. Wow. But I didn't think I could control my emotions. Yeah, you can. God will give you the emotions. All your joy comes from God. That's submitting your emotions. Allowing God to give you joy. That's a submitting of your emotions and allowing God's emotions to take over. Submit those to him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Is that right? I am right. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. That's where everything is that you're being tempted by has always been there. Nothing new. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can in, in, endure it. <laughs> that's, that's actually two words in the uh, King James. Endure it. So, you're in the middle of something, and you think, there's no way, there's no way you cannot argue about it. There's no way. You ever said that? I could not be quiet. You ever said that? I just couldn't be quiet. It's not in my nature. That's right. It's not in your nature. But the Bible says, if you will give that over, God has provided a way for you to actually be quiet. By just allowing him to help you be quiet. You can't let him get away with it. Why? Why? Well, if it's of God, you can't stop it anyway. And if it's of man, it's going to fall on its face. You just have to be patient. But, 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 pride. Pride. Proverbs 16, 32. Whoever is slow to anger... Better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. I like that version. I'm going to read the version I got over here. It's a little different. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules the spirit than he who takes a city. 
man, if you can just submit to the Spirit, patiently submit to the Spirit. I think if we could get pride and patience down, then the people around us and our relationships would grow and the message could move on. I've said it all along, if you and I could just get out of the way, God can do some amazing things. Instead of believing that we have to go and fix every battle for God, if we just get out of the way and go with the message, if we would start believing that the message of Jesus isn't going to get out unless we do it with as much vigor that we believe we've got to stop every bad thing, the message of God could not ever be stopped. And you would, there would be people all over the place just following you around, wanting to know more about this guy who died, was buried, and rose again. If you had that kind of vigor, if you had that kind of commitment, I've often said, if I could get people who actually believed in the real Jesus to have as much compassion for people like Jehovah's Witnesses do, mother of pearl, this thing would blow up. But it's the same with you. If I could get you to take away all the outside influence and take all the extra energy that you have with all the peripheral things and channel it towards the message of Jesus and being his disciples in a lost and dying world, there would be no stopping. There would be all the, pro- all the problems that you're trying to fix anyway would go away because you cannot stop the things of God and the things of man will just fall on their face. And that's how it's got to go. Last one. Situation, pride, emotions. This one you're going to need to fasten your seatbelt. You're going to need to submit your mouth to God. And I realize it's a bigger miracle than the resurrection of Jesus for some of us. But really, but really, this is where it all happens. Your mouth is where it all happens. The relationships are torn down, the relationships are made, the relationships are are built up, the message goes out, the message doesn't go out. It's all in your mouth. Now that's not where it starts. We'll look at that in a minute. But How about if you just prayed this? God, put a filter on my mouth. God, just put a filter in front of my mouth. I'll tell you, that's, that's my, I ask anybody who comes around my house, I don't have a filter. That is one of my biggest problems. Some people would call it, you know, that's, that's kind of good, you know, you kind of know where you stand, or whatever. But no, we need to submit what we say, how we say, when we say, to God. Let him have control over our mouth. This is the prayer of David, David prayer, Psalm 141, verse 3. I'll just read what she puts. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. You understand that? Your lip jumps out there. Your tongue jumps out there and starts doing all these words. Your lip's a door. If you just keep the door shut, you'd have a lot less arguments, right? And you're out there going, yeah, it's a little simple, but if I kept my mouth shut, they wouldn't know what I thought. That's my point. Your desires would not come out, which the Bible says is where all arguments come from. It's ridiculous. But i got to start watching my mouth just to be a good Christian. Nobody else does it. Colossians 3, verse 15. I'm giving you your argument. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. There we go. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. There we go. Now we're starting to get to the real core of the problem. The reason you're having problems controlling your mouth, that, that tongue where the Bible says it's like the rudder of a big ship, it steers everything, is because there's a problem down deep. Your desires that you're allowing to be the core of who you are are bad, and they're in the heart. Luke 6, 45. The good person, I'll just read it. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. There it is. I love that verse. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In King James, that's two words. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Some of you are full of it. You're full of it. And that's what comes out. And there's nothing you can do about it but clean it up. 
get back to the core message. Just think about that. What does everybody you've come in contact with over the past week think is in your heart? What has come out of your mouth that every person you've come in contact with knows is in your heart? It's who you are. All those opportunities to share the message. Instead, you shared, fill in the blank. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk, unwholesome talk, come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Some of you are going to, if you'll list, if you'll do that, some of you are going to say a lot less words. Right? I mean, if you were to take away unwholesome, you define unwholesome like you want to define it. I'm not going to tell you what's unwholesome. That would be stupid. You know what's unwholesome. Take out the unwholesome stuff that you talk about and just think about how many words you get to save. How much oxygen will be available for everybody else? Use only helpful words. There's another version of this. Do not use harmful words in talking. Use only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed. Wouldn't it be cool if you started using your words and it actually provided what is needed and what is needed? There was this guy who died, was buried, and rose again. And he provided an amazing freedom that gave me the ability to have eternal life that I started the day I met him. That's <laughs> really cool. That's what's needed. No, no, that's not what's needed. What's needed is that we don't, we don't need to let these states start having same-sex marriages. That's what's needed. Really? No, 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 what's needed? No, that's not what's needed. What's needed, we need some governmental reform here. We need to start having more available. What, what's needed is that we don't let, they don't, the government can't take away our tax our tax credits for the churches, that's what's needed. What's needed, that's what's needed. We need us a Christian president, that's what's needed. That's what's needed. No, 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 no. Only what comes out of your mouth is what's needed. And what's needed is the message of Jesus. That's what's needed. That's what's needed. Everything else, if it's of God, you can't stop it anyway. And if it's of man, it's going to fall on its face. So why are you involved at all? Only thing you need to be involved in is the message of Jesus. I keep saying it. I'm going to keep saying it. <sighs> Luke 6.45, I'm almost done. I'm not even close. I don't have Luke 6. Yeah, I do. A good man brings good things out of a good stored up in his heart. We just do that? Wow, that's really bad. I'm starting to go backwards. All right, you just tell me what's next. Makes it easier. Ah, yeah, I like that. I like that. So what happens if my heart still has all those bad things in it? You didn't get your new one. It's a very simple process. God says, I'll simply take out your old one, and I'll give you a new one. I'll take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll give you one that's moldable. I'll give you one that I can manipulate. I'll give you one that, that I can insert things into. You ever tried to put something in a stone? Difficult. So if you're out there and you're thinking, man, I do say a lot of crap. That must mean my heart's full of crap. How do I fix that? I let God give me a new one. I, I let him take over my heart. I stop being the pig I am, take out my heart of stone, and start looking at people with a soft well, you're a softy we're on the right track i start looking at people that need the message of jesus regardless of what their problem is and i don't argue with them about their problem i simply give them the message because when i argue with them about their problem the stuff that's in my heart is pride and impatience and all those things that is stone it's stone all right, what's the next one? We can plot some. Psalm 5110. Create me. There you go. And how do I get it? How does God give me one? I just ask for one. It's really easy. Create in me a pure heart, a clean heart. Oh, God. There's another one of them double words. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. You do it, God. I'm just, I'm just going to give it to you. I want you to give me a new one. I expect you to give me a new one. We're off to the races. 
So you can beat yourself up if you want to. Well, I must not be a Christian. I must not be a very good one. Why don't you just pray that? God, give me a clean heart. Give me a pure heart. I know you will, and then I will share the message. I will share the message. There's probably one more, right? Top 18. Yeah. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. I think that's the NIV version of my version that says, listen before you answer. If you don't, you're being stupid and insulting. That's a version of the James verse that says, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Is that right? It's your verse. You like it. Don't give them the last verse. One verse and we're leaving. I don't know what this next verse means. I know what it means, but I don't know what it means for your life. Because I don't want it to scare you because I don't think God ever does anything to scare us. But it is a very scary verse. Especially for those of us who are going to walk out of here and go, man, I know who Jesus is. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and I'm going to start representing him. I'm going to say, everybody, you know what, I'm going to do this. There's no reason for me to go out there and be the, be the moron. There's enough morons in the world. But here's what the Bible says that you're going to have to come to grips with. Matthew 12, 36. But I tell you, this is, and these are words in red if you're looking at a, you know, a real Bible. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every, what? Say those two next words out loud. I'll give you another chance. For I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every, they have spoken. Every empty word you've spoken. Can you, I, like I said, I don't know what that's going to look like. But I don't like it. Can you imagine having to give an account for just last week's empty words? Because some of y'all are older than a week. So to think about that as we go forward, I don't want to give an account for empty words. Do you? Anybody out there want to give an account for empty words? I know how to not. Don't say them. It's the same way you win every single argument. Don't argue. And we're not going to do arguing, and we're not going to say empty words so that the message that there was a guy who died, was buried, and rose again to give me an amazing freedom that I can have eternal life that started the day I met him can be pushed forward. And that's why. And that's why. I pray that every one of you in the next week are finally asked, well, why didn't you argue about that? It's going to be an amazing opportunity to share that message. Stand with me and let's get out there and get with it. God, I pray.